we've been very fortunate, I think, um, in truth, fiction, illusion, worlds, and experience in having five great plenary speakers um, who have not only just come and delivered plenary talks, but have been involved in all sorts of other sessions as well, including Close, close Encounters, fascinating podium discussion earlier on between Mark and Ashil. So, in three short days, we've had a really packed itinerary. It's almost difficult to believe it's time to bring it to a close, but we are fortunate again in having Ashil and Bendy present our final plenary. I'll say one or two words, although possibly I need not do so. Um, Ashil is Professor in History and Politics in the Witz Institute of Social and Economic Research and the University of Witzwasserland, Johannesburg. He also has a visiting appointment at the Franklin Humanities Institute at Duke University. And of his many books, I can pick out a few Les Jeunes et l'Ordre Politique en Afrique Noire, which as far as I'm aware has not been translated, um, but already sounds some of the notes that we've got used to over the years in reading Achille's work. Um, this De la Post-Colonie, on the post-colony, which has been translated, I think it was translated in the early 2000s. Um, very widely read recently, Critique de la Raison Negre um, from 2013, translated as Critique of Black Reason in 2017. And most recently, Politique de la Namité, de, de la Namité, right, yes, which will be translated as, I believe, the politics of en enmity. Necropolitics is coming out as necropolitics. I wanted to um, cite Ashil very briefly before introducing him for his talk, which will be called Bodies as Borders. Um, a recent paper that I've been discussing and circulating amongst people includes the statement, because of the current atrophy of a utopian imagination, Apocalyptic imaginaries and narratives of cataclysmic disasters and unknown futures have colonized the spirit of our time. And listening to many of the talks today throughout many of the uh, sessions, this sense of an atrophied utopian imagination has been strong. So in a way, this going against the grain um, and trying to think in utopian terms once again, in, in a way that we haven't seen, I think, for time, has been quite important for so many people trying to think through the situation we find ourselves in the 21st century. Not just in certain places we can identify China, which people have been talking about, Africa, but what we have been calling, with great caution, the world. And this quotation comes from the article, the idea of a borderless world which is a somewhat paradoxical, strange kind of notion, but an interesting notion, a utopian notion. In fact, it defines utopia, as Ashil points out. But what politics, he goes on, do visions of apocalypse and catastrophe engender, if not a politics of separation? Which is, a, in general terms, our problem, perhaps, rather than a politics of the humanity as species coming into being. So that's, that's the quotation. There's so much more in this article that concerns borders, that concerns rights, that concerns freedom, which is right at the heart of what Ashil's work gets to, I think. Um, and the fundamental principle, relation rather than essence. And I'll leave it there. I can't wait to hear the talk, Bodies, <laughs> bodies as Borders. I can very speak. Um, thank you, Ashil.
Perfect. Um, uh, th thank you, John, for, for your very kind introduction. Uh, I would like to informally thank the, uh, the association and the journal uh, for uh, a very uh, gracious uh, invitation. Uh, I was very happy to, to be here. Uh, uh, the invitation gave me the opportunity to meet extraordinary people. Uh, Bernard, who, who, who is uh, uh, sitting right here, uh, from whom I have learned uh, so much. Uh, and to reconnect with uh, a very old friend, uh, Scott, uh, who I like to tease, um, uh, Ryan, John, Mike, Peter and Bruce, who uh, welcomed me yesterday with a beautiful session uh, on uh, uh, some of my work. My intervention uh, tonight is, a, is a, really a set of uh, uh, urgent, uh, fragmentary, and uh, unfinished reflections on uh, our global present. Uh, global present seen from where I live and work uh, which is Africa, which is uh, South Africa. When I say our global present, what I truly have in mind is what we discussed with uh, uh, Bernard uh, this morning. What I have in mind is uh, the uh, sustainability and durability of our planet. Uh, as a matter of fact, this is uh, an almost uh, existential preoccupation, which is increasingly uh, expressed in many different voices, and which is shared by various people all over the world. Indeed, many are wondering how should we inhabit anew and share as equitably as possible a planet whose life support uh, system has been so severely damaged by human activities and that is uh, in dire need of repair. How should we inhabit it anew and share it? And in view of the deep state of fragmentation the planet finds itself in, they are asking, how should we remember it? Remember it, that is, put it back together. Put back together its different parts, reassemble it, and reconstitute it as an integrated system in which humans and non-humans, physical, chemical, and biological components oceans, atmosphere, and land surface are all interlinked as in a, in a grand gesture of mutuality. These questions of inhabitation, you know, I see I'm avoiding questions of dwelling, uh, <laughs> in any sense. These questions of inhabitation and interconnection of mutuality, sustainability, and durability, in short, of the interlacing of human history and Earth's history, these questions are far from abstract concerns. In fact, the ongoing long-term planetary environmental changes have only further dramatized them. And in my mind, and in the mind of many, there is little doubt that uh, they will be at the center of any debate on the future of life and the future of reason in this century. To properly attend to them, I think, forces us to refocus our attention on three mega processes that have an almost overwhelming bearing on what humanity and the planet we live on, the only one so far where life is known to exist, on what they might become. 
this. The first mega process I would like to comment on is the unprecedented consolidation of power and knowledge in the hands of private high-tech corporate entities, entities whose uh, sphere of action is not one country or one region, but the globe. Corporate sovereignty has taken various forms throughout history. Uh, take, for instance, the English East India Company, its political dominance in some parts of uh, the Indian subcontinent in the 18th century. A composite, uh, diffused, and hybrid entity. The company exercised forms of power customarily associated with former state institutions. It was, if you wish, part of the colonial nomos of the earth, which typified the epoch that started with the conquest of the Americas in the 15th century, the sale of African slaves from the 16th century to the 19th century, up to the undoing of the last racist state, uh, South Africa, in the 20th century. Colonial Nomos was founded on taking possession of foreign lands. That is, on conquest. The seizure of land went hand in hand with the exercise of authority over people. Private corporate entities could engage, for instance, in wide-ranging operations, such as uh, tax collection, and war uh, making, and in competition with the monarchical and national state, private corporate sovereignty was a key part of the different institutional and constitutional forms that shaped imperial expansion. The conditions that have made possible the expansion of privatized government in the first half of the 21st century are well known. And many of these have to do, of course, with various legal frameworks uh, behind international trade agreements, <coughs> foreign investment uh, treaties, and other mechanisms that have turned markets into the single most and disputed forces of our times. Others have to do with, of course, the uh, computational transformations of financial markets and the possibilities afforded by media technologies, as uh, Bernard uh, uh, told us yesterday. So we are at a point, in fact, uh, where we do no longer know whether the old distinction between the economic power of corporations and the political sovereignty of states, whether this distinction still holds. Whether it does, in fact, is uh, uh, more and more open to debate. But the fact is that most global corporations nowadays aspire to secede from everybody else while exercising surveillance on everybody else. Their big dream is to be exempt from taxes and to be free from accountability. In short, to enjoy the kind of immunity and state of exceptionality we used to recognize only to truly sovereign powers. In a recent book by what she terms surveillance capitalism, Johanna Zuboff <coughs> argues that uh, a global architecture of behavior modification uh, is uh, underway. Driven by powerful states, high-tech corporations, and military apparatuses, surveillance capitalism threatens what she calls human nature uh, in the 21st century, just as uh, 
industrial capitalism disfigured the natural world in the 20th. She shows the extent to which vast wealth is accumulated in what she terms behavioral futures markets, that is, markets where uh, predictions about our behavior are bought and sold. And uh, the production of goods and services is subordinated to new means of behavioral modification. Indeed, capital, especially finance capital, has become our shared infrastructure. Our nervous system, the kind of transcendental more that nowadays maps out our world and its <coughs> psychophysical limits. Around us, it looks as if nothing escapes its control. Affects, emotions and feelings, manifestations of desire, dreams or thoughts, no sphere of contemporary life has been left untouched by the spread of capital. Capital now extends its grasp deep into the underbelly of the world. In its way, it leaves vast fields of debris and toxins, waste heaps of humans ravaged by sores and boils. And now that everything is a potential source of capitalization, it has made a world of itself, a hallucinatory phenomenon of planetary dimensions. Late 20th century corporate sovereignty is therefore, as far as we can see, an unprecedented form of power <coughs> whose main aspiration is to free itself from democratic oversight. As a result, we might no longer live in an epoch when sovereignty was exercised by the demos. The demos properly understood might no longer be the sovereign. Finance capital in the guise of uh, a ubiquitous digital architecture might have definitely become the new Leviathan. So what we are witnessing, part of what we are witnessing, is the historical bifurcation between liberal democracy and finance capitalism, and the emergence, as I argue, of this new form of sovereignty, which claims for itself the law of immunity and the powers of exception. That is the first mega process I want you to comment uh, upon. The second mega process I would like to invoke is technological escalation and the ways in which it has redefined the nature of speed, the way in which it has unshackled markets and the economy, and the way it constantly monitors our behavior in an attempt at revealing how this behavior could be modified and optimized. As a matter of fact, some of the fastest expanding markets in the world today are markets for future behavior. They rely on better understanding incipient future intent. This could be future voting intentions, the intent to commit fraud, the intent to buy life insurance, or the intent to stream a specific video. These markets for future behavior also rely on the extraction and mining of new forms of raw material. Such raw material mostly consists of information and details about individuals' behavior taken from the distant corners of our unconscious, the market of the unconscious. 
It's raw material plumbed from intimate patterns of the self, our personality, our moods, our emotions, even our lives, every level of our intimacy. The purpose is not only to heighten the predictability of our behavior, is also to make life itself amenable to uh, datification. A key feature of our times is therefore the extent to which all societies are organized according to the same principle, the computational. Let's just call it the computational. It's not only because we are surrounded with ubiquitous technologies that weave themselves into the fabric of our everyday lives, uh, devices, sensors, things we interact with and which have become part of our presence in the world all the time. The question of how the boundary between us and these devices is enacted being, of course, a matter of open debate. It's also because the computational has a force and energy of a spe special kind. <coughs> it is a force and energy that produces and serializes subjects, objects, phenomena, that splits reason from consciousness and memory, that codes and stores data, that can be used then to manufacture new types of services, But the computational is also the prototype of a dream machine. And what I'm going to say now relies somewhat on, we are talking about it yesterday with Bernard and uh, Scott, on a kind of, let's call it a misreading, uh, intentional conscious misreading of Foucault's work on Binswam, <coughs> dream and existence. So I would like to consider the computation as a prototype of a dream machine of a special kind, a, a peculiar institution. As we know, there are different kinds of dream machines. If an object at all, the computational is an object that seems to exceed its object would. There are not many objects which seek to exceed their object would. This one does. It exceeds its object would in the sense that we dream of it. It exceeds its object would through its quality of being automatic of, of seeming to move itself, and it doesn't need any uh, agent to move it, it's automobile if you want. It has inner, an inner capacity for motion, an inner capacity to constantly move across into the condition of a quasi-subject. So this movement from objecthood to subjecthood or quasi-subjecthood, I think is an event of very particular signification. <coughs> Just as the African slave during the period of Atlantic capitalism, stood vicariously for the object and for the machine. So he started to have that element where the slave, the, the slave in the plantations in the Americas, was an object of a special kind, if you want. A speaking object, in the sense that it was supposed to be a concatenation of the human and the object at the same time. But now we have the reverse. 
an object moving by its inner force across the line that goes from object hood to uh, quasi subject hood. So the, in that sense, the computational is a force and energy. Uh, in the sense that it constantly exhibits such potential for substitution, such potential for fantasy, the force of fantasy and the fantasy of force brings both of them together. It makes us dream of it. But the computation is not simply a machine of which we dream. It is also a machine for generating dreams while controlling and directing the dreaming process itself. It is both the machine of which we dream and the machine we dream with, dreaming of and dreaming with, which provides it quite a peculiar force and a peculiar energy. In that sense, it is the ultimate force and at the same time, the ultimate budget, the thing through which the mental, the psychic, the neurological, and the technical are fused the machine through which our brains are subjected to rhythmic stimulus. So you know, it's a kind of uh, spinning wheel which keeps sending all kinds of signals to our brains, incoming and outgoing signals. Our brains are forced to check and are induced to respond to, and signals that an activity that might cause us extensive brain damage. Here, I'm now moving from Foucault, my misreading of Foucault, so it builds on that, and a uh, uh, number of things uh, Bernard has uh, taught us. I could go on on this, but the point I'm really trying to make is about uh, the extent to which the computational might end up perforating our brains. The extent to which it might end up inducing intense visual and otherwise sensations. The extent to which it might end up sweeping us out of time. Changing our brain dynamics, thereby rendering us not at all creative, but epileptic. I'm now talking to Bernard once again on his, what he was telling us about the possibility of being stupid and mad at the same time. To which I add the risk of becoming part of ep epileptic subjects uh, through the uh, inducement of these dream machines. Uh, which act on not only our nerves, the neurological system, but also, and more importantly, on our brain. Which raises, of course, all kinds of questions having to do with recovery. But I don't have the time to go into that part now because uh, we have to, have to accelerate a bit uh, what I'm sharing with you. So that's the second mega process. I think we are forced to confront in our attempt at uh, imagining uh, a planet we could all inhabit, we could all make a claim upon, and we could all share, to share it being the precondition for its sustainability and its durability. The third mega process has to do with what I call the dialectics of entanglement and separation. Or you can call it the dialectics of entanglement and secession. It seems to me that we live in an epoch when there have not been such an urge to separate, to divorce, if you want. 
So many people want to defend. I mean, say people, entities in the British, they, they want to get out of Europe. In my own country where I was born, uh, the Anglophone part of Cameroonians, they don't want to have anything to do with the Francophones. And yet, uh, it's impossible for them to, to separate these dialectics of entanglement and this desire for apartheid, which is uh, saturating uh, contemporary imagination. We thought we had dealt with apartheid in South Africa, that it was part of our past, only to discover that, in fact, apartheid might be our future. So, so that's what I want to comment upon very briefly now. It seems to me, and this has been said by many, that all over the world, the combination of fossil capital, soft power warfare, saturation of the everyday by digital technologies, all of this has led to the acceleration of speed and the intensification of connections. Whatever qualification you want to put onto those connections, the fact is that they are there. And they are there to remain. But this has also led to a new redistribution of the earth and of population movement. To be alive, to, or to remain alive today, for me, is increasingly tantamount to being able to move speedily. In the process, the human race has come up against terrestrial limits, and such limits are not only the consequence of the spherically of the planet, they are also limitations the colleague was talking about the Hegelian distinction between limits and limitation. There are also limitations on the expansion of life as such. And as the planet increasingly seems bound to burn, it is not only the individuated bodies which are in peril. It is earthly existence, the fate of everything on Earth, the fluidity of life, which is at stake. Meanwhile, we are more than ever before and at any other time in human history, not only in close proximity to each other, but also exposed to each other. This close proximity and exposure is experienced less and less as opportunity and possibility, and more and more as heightened risk. But entanglement and exposure to each other are not all that characterize the now. Wherever we look, the drive is simultaneously and decisively towards contraction, towards containment, towards enclosure, and various forms of encampment, detention, and incarceration. The reality of mass incarceration is a definitive uh, feature of our time. There have never been as many human beings as there are today in jail, in various forms of prisons. Beginning with the United States of America, Russia, China, South Africa, where I live, why is it that there are so many people in prison today? There have never been as many camps as they are today. And most of these camps are, mind you, in Europe. They are not elsewhere, they are in Europe. So it seems to me that this uh, question of contraction, of containment, of enclosure, uh, detention, deportation, is uh, an important matter. Typical of this logic of contraction, incarceration, and closure 
is the worldwide erection of all kinds of walls and fortifications, gates and enclaves. To this should be added various practices of partitioning space, of offshoring and fencing of wealth, of splintering territories, fragmenting spaces, saddling them with various kinds of borders, borders whose function is to decelerate movement, to stop it in some instances for certain classes of populations, in order, we are told, to manage risks. Numerous reasons are mobilized indeed to account for this renewed infatuation with borders, borders taken as the best way to manage risks. Security and the preservation of one's identity are some of these reasons. And as it happens, physical and virtual barriers <coughs> of separation, digitalization of databases, <coughs> filing systems, development of new tracking devices, sensors, drones, satellites and sentinel robots, infrared detectors, various other cameras, biometric controls, new microchips containing personal details, everything is put in place to transform the very nature of the border in the name of security. Borders are increasingly turned into mobile, portable, omnipresent, and ubiquitous realities. As I said, the goal is to better control movement and speed, accelerating it here, decelerating it there, and in the process, sorting, recategorizing, reclassifying people with the goal of better selecting new who is who, who should be where, and who shouldn't, all in the name of security. As a result, borders are no longer merely lines of demarcation, separating distinct sovereign entities. Increasingly, they are the name we should use to describe the organized violence that underpins both contemporary capitalism and our world order in general. But perhaps, to be exact, we should speak not of borders in general, but instead of borderization, that is, the process by which certain spaces are transformed into uncrossable places for certain classes of populations who thereby undergo a process of racialization, places where speed must be disabled and the lives of a multitude of people judged to be undesirable are meant to be immobilized, if not shattered. The figures are astounding. On the southern flank of the European border, there have been, over the last 10 years, more than 35,000 people who have uh, died trying to cross the Mediterranean. So what I'm talking about is not a figment of my imagination. Whatever the case, the transformation, technological transformation of borders is in full swing. In a sense, one of the major consequences of the acceleration of technological innovations has been the creation of a segmented planet of multiple speed regimes. And uh, once again, this is part of the new nomos of the Earth. This part of uh, the new partition of the world which is unfolding uh, underneath uh, uh, technological escalation we were talking about. A key development of late is the extent to which border security practices have taken a keen interest in the connection between the human body and identity <coughs> as a means to achieve detailed control of movement and speed. 
This being the case, the question we must ask is the following. What precisely is at stake in the extension of the border, especially the biometric border, into multiple realms of social life, and in particular, the human body? Not the human body in general, of course. Let's just call them discounted bodies. And I use the term discounted in its many uh, different meanings. Discounted, poor, poor value or no value at all. Discounted meaning abandoned. Uh, it's, it's a rather uh, fluid uh, concept. In other words, what explains the migration from the border understood as a particular point in space to the border as the moving body of the desired masses of population. One of the answers is the new global partitioning between potentially risky bodies and bodies that are supposedly not. But we have to go beyond that. Theories of risk to account for uh, <coughs> turning of the body into the body, and vice versa. We have to go beyond that and uh, I won't have the time to do it now, but it's an issue I think we have to address. So I have given you three mega processes. I think there are many more, of course. I chose this because I'm uh, particularly interested in, in, in them. Uh, uh, from where I, I live and work, there are many more uh, we could have uh, uh, brought in. But let me now just, as I'm trying to move to uh, uh, make some deductions uh, from the tableaus I have shared with you, let me say a few things about what I call discounted bodies. I think part of what we are witnessing as a, a result of the three mega processes I referred to is another implication, a symbiotic merging of life and mobility. Life as mobility, if you want. To be alive or to survive is more and more coterminous with the capacity to move. Just as living, movement in turn involves continual doublings, the incessant crossing of multiple lines and thresholds, multiple transitions across layers. Life itself is more and more taken as something that can be calculated and recombined rather than merely represented. Furthermore, we are witnessing a bifurcation between life on the one hand and bodies on the other. Nowadays, not every body is thought of as containing life. Discounted bodies are believed to contain no life as such. They are, strictly speaking, bodies at the limits of life bodies trapped in an, an inhabitable worlds and inhospitable places. The kind of life they bear or contain is not insured, or to put it differently, is an insurable, folded as it, it is in extreme and thin envelopes. One of those extreme and thin envelopes being, of course, the skin and its color. I saw the uh, TRC, TCS uh, special issue on the skin. As indeed that kind of thin envelope uh, that is uh, recovering 
a flesh that might not uh, have value. Such bodies on the precipice are the most exposed, of course, to droughts, <coughs> storms and famines, toxic waste, and various experiences of effacement. Their livelihoods made impossible, they are the most likely to sustain the most crippling wounds and injuries. Trapped human subjects often without escape, they are caught in the various death management systems that saturate the contemporary world. The question of micropolitics, and micromass, uh, and so on and on, they literally bear the brunt of terrestrial life on a damaged planet. At the same time, they exceed all attempts to contain them. These bodies are not simply in motion, interactive and generative, they are movements and events. The inside of such bodies is not separated from their outward environments. And from the perspective of discounted bodies, to be alive is always and already to breach boundaries or to be exposed to the risk of the outside entering the inside. So it seems to me that these developments, they have been an acceleration of these developments, of the breakdown of those kinds of separations we used to establish between what is inside and what is outside. Both metaphorically, in an embodied manner, but also uh, pretty ob objective. The disentanglement <coughs> of life from discounted bodies, this redistribution of life on differential scales of insurability and non insurability, is a key dimension of contemporary migration regimes. The latter aim either at slowing down the dynamics of people's interactions, at creating distance, or at shattering the chains of relations between the people, so as to institute new patterns of separation. Contemporary movement restrictions are not limited to national boundaries. They are at work at a global scale they are deepening the space and time as symmetries between different categories of humanity, while leading to the progressive ghettoization of entire regions of the world. To a large extent, this is, if you want, I don't know to be polemical, but uh, it's a polemic that rests on uh, some empirical evidence. To a large extent, these are akin to a universalization of the Israeli model. In this model, the restriction of movement does not necessarily aim to confine unwanted people territorially or to dissociate their movements from those of uh, uh, citizens, but to inscribe them, in this case, Palestinians, into temporalities and spatialities that are disjointed disjointed to the point of giving these populations the illusion of being territorially separated. Because as we all know, separation between them is, is impossible. The more it is impossible, the more the illusion has to be created, territorially and otherwise, that it exists. So, we can extend this quick analysis of Israeli-Palestine model uh, to other places. The black ghettos <coughs> in America is exactly the same thing. Go to Detroit, uh, manifestation of this desire for separation in terms of the militarization of the police, in terms of the political economy of, of fines, racial profiling, uh, uh, the control of movement of blacks uh, in major cities, 
and its connection to earlier histories of immobilization, of the fact that black Americans have had a hard time ever moving free, moving unchained, if you want. So the dream of moving unchained, we understand why it has been an amazing utopian potential in the black radical tradition, for instance. So, now, let me try to wrap all of this, wrap it up. Let me just say this. You might have had the sense <coughs> throughout uh, this uh, presentation that uh, I'm somewhat uh, falling back onto the uh, social death uh, argument that is central to Afro-pessimism. Afro-pessimism as uh, articulated especially in some sectors of the black intelligentsia <coughs> in the U.S. But I'm not. That's why I will conclude with the figure of the black slave under conditions of racial capitalism. I bring back the black slave uh, in relation to the becoming black of the world hypothesis of which we spoke about today. As I just argued, part of what is typical of the black slave under slavery is the attempt at turning this human being into a thing. And not metaphorically, actually, historically, but, and this has been <coughs> a, a part of the um, the, the, the kind of reflections that from pessimism has been engaged in. <coughs> and in fact, the history of blacks in America has been the history of social death. The concept of social death, uh, having been articulated in the mid-80s by Orlando Patterson, who is a professor of sociology at Harvard University. Now, what I want to say is that the argument about social death has its limits. Because historically, wherever African slaves happened to be settled, no death of social life actually occurred. The work of producing symbols, rituals, language, memory, meaning, and therefore, the uh, substance necessary to sustain life, that labor <coughs> never stopped. Nor did the interminable labor of caring for and repairing that which had been broken, including the infrastructures of survival. Through the <coughs> captivity, African slaves never stopped desiring freedom. So how do we work with desire? The Sisyphus-like effort to resist being turned into waste partly explains why plantation slavery differs from other forms of genocidal colonialism. In fact, inherent to the human is something that can never be turned into an object. That's what Fanon teaches us. Something ineradicable, and this is the desire to be free. So, History of the slave is not so much about social death as it is about the permanent generation, recreation, and resignification of life flows 
in the face of the forces of capture and desiccation. Of course, the two poles of recreation and desiccation are inseparable. The body that is supposed to work is the same body that is continually under attack and made redundant. Ropes are drawn tight, ribs are shattered. In the process, various organs are sucked dry or destroyed. It becomes impossible to breathe with one's lungs, just like uh, the informal trader in the park in New York, who is accosted by the police and accused of selling cigarettes, and is caught by the police, brought down to the earth, and his last words is, I, I can't breathe. And then, He's dead. So, it becomes impossible to breathe with one's lungs. At the same time, the endless labor of restoring that which has been destroyed goes on. Many have been, of course, defeated in this peculiar struggle. Because peculiar is this struggle. But sewing up the holes, preventing the destroyed body from being completely torn apart, reconnecting the tissues and blocking the points of blockage, getting out of the hole, breaking through the wall, this has been a key part of the dialectics. If you wish, the line of writing that historically prevented many from drowning in the ocean of pessimism, despair, and nihilism. And I'll end here, because underlying all of this is, of course, the question of unreason and unfreedom. For those who for centuries were condemned to live their lives in a cage, reason often took the face of an inhuman head and the form of wolf's jaws, a machine geared towards the elimination of certain classes of human beings located at the interface of the human and the non-human, or if you want, of the human, the commodity, and the object. I will end it there, and thank you for your attention. and I'm sure there will be questions. Thanks very much. Just <laughs> 
Um, th thanks very much, uh, Ashu. Um, at times in your talk, I got a sense of totalizing machine, structural reading, um, where, in fact, there's a long history of calculation and abstraction, back to Greek geometry. You ended uh, with reason in the wolf's jaws. And I wondered about um, the role or the importance of history in uneven geographies and intensities, because otherwise I think in telling the story in such a dramatic and totalizing way, we make it inadvertently harder to imagine a planet that we could inhabit sustainably uh, together, and therefore necessarily in diverse and um, um, divergent ways. Thanks. Yeah, I have uh, here uh, two intertwined questions. The first one being, did I get you right that you are arguing for some kind of re-enchantment of humanism? Uh, I mean, could you imagine to even replace the, uh, uh, or not to replace, to oppose, let's say, the uh, becoming uh, black of the world with something like a becoming human uh, in all its ambiguities, of course, of the world? And the second question, which for me is intertwined, would it make sense for you that some kind of alternative notion of the human would be a, let's say, relational uh, one? Uh, let's say the, the, rela the human is the relation of more than one uh, human, including also all the colonial uh, um, burden uh, to it, let's say. say that the, uh, the uh, desire for freedom has um, uh, totally ev evaporated uh, uh, all over the world. Uh, uh, many are still uh, mobilizing uh, in, in all kinds of uh, struggles uh, for freedom. Um, they take many different forms in where I live and work. Uh, the struggle, there was a moment when uh, the struggle for freedom uh, was uh, geared towards political liberation. As soon as uh, political liberation was achieved, we entered a new cycle of struggles, uh, which are struggles for uh, everyday uh, existence. Struggles around uh, key issues like uh, <clears throat> like eating, having food, being able to, to make it from today to tomorrow, and uh, issues such as housing uh, in a country where uh, many people are homeless, uh, not because of them willing to be homeless, but as a result of uh, long historical policies of uh, eviction of uh, this possession and uh, 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 disappropriation, if you want. So, so all of these uh, struggles around uh, basic needs if you want, are ongoing, um, and uh, uh, they are the object of a number of uh, uh, critical reflections, uh, which uh, nurture uh, the. Uh, deep histories of, of, of freedom. And yet, at the same time, we notice, I uh, take the example of South Africa, but I'm sure we can extend this to other parts of the world, the extent to which, we notice the extent to which, and um, more and more, <clears throat> many are De democracy is demanding. It's demanding, and it's uh, many are, for instance, voting for rulers who really do not have their interests at, uh, at heart. They're voting against their own interests. I think we have to think 
properly about that phenomenon. And of course, outside of broad generalizations, case by case, why is it that I would vote for someone who will implement a policy that goes directly, objectively against what, what I, I, I'm fighting for? It's, uh, it's uh, a paradox we need to attend to. And there are places where you can not dream of a strong man, and let's just have a strong man who will solve uh, things on, on our behalf. So, so that seems to me to be part of the uh, uh, paradoxical equation we, we, we are facing. Now, uh, is the story I'm telling uh, too totalizing? To some extent, it is. And uh, it's also uh, quite speculative. It's a mixture of uh, uh, different uh, discourses, if you want. And it seems to me that in the kind of impasse we find ourselves, which manifests itself in many different forms, in different locations, parts of uh, our planet, we need to rethink what it means for us to write, or it means to speak. What does discourse stand, stands for? And what I have tried to do is to articulate a discourse that is both analytical, poetic, uh, that it speaks to uh, reason, common sense, and, and, and utopia, uh, that uh, uh, is willing to uh, look at the abyss uh, in the hope of not falling into it, uh, which I ended up with. So, so, so this question of how is it that we speak in the midst of things which seem unspeakable uh, is, is, is something I would like to explore a bit more. Is it that what I'm saying is an attempt at re-enchanting humanism? I'm not really sure that that's what, what, what I'm after. And um, uh, in any case, it would be too late to enchant humanism uh, today. Of course, <laughs> okay, now let me really be schematic. Uh, 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 <coughs> because there's no longer, the human has disappeared. I mean, the human is. Uh, Okay, you will understand that it's what, uh, six o'clock, so I haven't, haven't had a glass of wine yet, but in anticipation of it, <laughs> let me just say that, you see, the human is the invention of a specific kind of metaphysics. I don't want to call it Western metaphysics because it doesn't make much sense, but it's the invention of a specific kind of metaphysics. If you take African pre-colonial metaphysics. What is the human? There is no human without something else, some other entity. It doesn't exist. Neither in West Africa, nor in Central Africa, nor in Southern or Eastern Africa. The human is by definition A composition. You compose the human out of multiple debris, entities, an animal, a tree, water, a fish, the sky, the wind, and so forth and so on. It's a cosmic composition made up of multiple species. You see, when I mean, you read this, I uh, don't know how many of you are anthropologists. Not so long ago, there was this multi species trip in anthropology. Welcome to Africa. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to Africa. Has always been multi species. And renewed uh, di discourses on animism the return of animism. Welcome to the continent. So uh, an exit from a moment in so-called knowledge systems 
when animism, the fact of believing that the human is a composition, was taken to be typical of what the Hebrew called primitive, the primitive mind. So, so they have as a way. So it's difficult to re-enchant humanism if one has never really believed in it. Which is my case. And this applies to many different uh, 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 instances. And how is it that we use re-enchanting, re democracy, for instance, knowing very well that it's one of the most anthropocentric forms of the political. How do we make sure that democracy, whether it's liberal or whatever, is not only democracy of the human, but extends to the living, the democracy of the living? What does it imply in terms of institutional imagination, in terms of the reinvention of the law? in terms of forms of belonging. And here again, if we look into a different archive, the African <laughs> Korean archive, we see very well how, for instance, a polity, a free polity, was always a polity that offered to people different forms of belonging, multi multiplicity, compositional, multiple. You could belong by virtue of being born there. But it was not the only form belonging. The community was created around a plastic, flexible set of mechanisms, the basis of which was you are powerful if you have many people with you, if you are able to aggregate around you as many people as possible which change systematically the calculus of people and things. It was a way of adjudicating the tension between people and things in a way that was uh, privileging not one, but privileging multiple relations among these two people, as opposed to a dualism. So we talk about migrants today and all that. It's because we are trapped in an episteme, which, which is a specific episteme of a specific part of the world. But it's not the whole of the story. But of course, I, I was trying to answer your question about humanism. Now it leads me to uh, talking about almost uh, everything. <laughs> so your question. Yes, uh, we have three questions. Thank you, um, for your talk. I was just struck by the notion that you're creating between freedom and life as mobility. And the question that I was asking myself in the context of the history you've been telling is, is this idea of mo life as mobility and needing to move does it relate to a kind of fight or flight option? And if freedom is in a sense about being able to fly away from a problem, and what you were saying just now about community and being related to place seems to me somehow in opposition to that need to move. And my question, my question is motivated by the fact of working with um, three projects in Africa, one in um, Côte d'Ivoire, one in Cameroon, and one in Senegal. And all three of these projects are about creating communities in place. So about developing meaning of life within a community that's already existing. Um, uh, pleading
need for, for what we could call an exit option. In, 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 uh, in my understanding of movement or mobility or circulation, uh, 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 my, my critique of, of motion uh, uh, is not centered primarily around uh, the uh, uh, possibility of, of escape. Although, uh, <laughs> when we look at how things are, uh, uh, escape uh, uh, under a number of circumstances uh, is a moral uh, obligation. It's a moral obligation, uh, especially in a context in which um, the uh, people's environment uh, has been entirely destroyed. It has been made inhospitable and uh, it, it has been made and inhabitable. And uh, this is true of many parts of our world today. When you go to Nigeria, for instance, in the Delta region of Nigeria, the Delta region of Nigeria, like many other parts of the mentioned the eastern part of the Congo and all that, is one of the richest regions of the earth. It is endowed with almost everything, like most parts of the continent of Africa. It is endowed in particular with wealth in both oil and gas, natural gas. It's endowed with rivers, multiple rivers, a huge uh, water endowment, so much water, full of fish, at least until a uh, uh, few decades ago. So, in the Delta region, uh, British uh, Petroleum, I think that's the name, has been exploiting oil for almost half a century. They have been burning gas because of a number of reasons, some of them purely economic, that uh, you can make enough money selling it. Uh, there's no, not enough interest. There are many reasons which have nothing to do with the well-being of of the people, they, they, they partake of purely economic calculations. Uh, but they have been, if you go there, you see gas burning, total waste, total expenditure, if you want, uh, a la bataille. And then, of course, the waters have been completely polluted. The fish has disappeared. And, uh, there's nothing to show in the region in so far as quote unquote development is concerned. There's nothing. There are no schools, no clinics, zero. So most of the wealth is extracted and shipped with the collusion, of course, of the Nigerian kleptocracy, of course, as what it is, and predatory multinational corporations. All of them together. So internal predation, external predation. Combining to leave behind a heap of garbage, toxic environments, children dying of uh, pulmonary, per, per, whatever you call it, diseases. They can't breathe. They can't eat properly. Where they used to, there were, there were techniques of dealing with the environment without destroying it, letting fish, the fish reserve uh, replenish itself through a careful interaction between humans and uh, whatever they were in relation with. All of that has been destroyed. Frankly, I wouldn't ask any of them to stay there. There's nothing to do with it, nothing to do. There's no life that is, would be possible in such an environment. And extractive forms of capitalism in Africa, that is exactly how they have operated. They have destroyed a lot of the environment. And people have been forced to move. Most people are not happy to move. People want to stay where 
they will go. It's as natural as that. That's why they have the connections with families, with ancestors, with the cosmic entities they are part of and with which they want to compose because life is about composition. They want to stay there. They don't want to come to places where I mean, they have never seen, where they know nobody. And more importantly, where they are not welcome. Nobody wants them. It's not as if they arrived this morning and the city of uh, whatever, people go welcoming them. We're so happy to see you. Uh, this is food. This is place where to. No. They is um, hospitable. So how do you move from one and um, hospitable, a place that has been made um, hospitable and inhabitable to a place where nobody wants you? That's the dilemma. When we talk about migrants, you know, that that's what somebody is at stake. So I will encourage them to stay. Of course I will encourage them to fight. And we were talking about it, I think, either yesterday or this morning. And my sense of time now is totally messed up. <laughs> That's why I was saying that, look, Africa has to open herself to herself and become a vast space of circulation. It's 30 million square kilometers. You travel from Casablanca to Cape Town, down south, you spend 10 hours in the plane, non-stop. You go from Nairobi to Dakar, it's nine hours. It's colossal. There's absolutely no reason whatsoever. In fact, we should be, <laughs> those of you who are in happy Europe, we should be receiving. <laughs> the Chinese want to go and listen. see that a lot of space to be happy. So how come that 30,000 people have to die trying to cross the ocean to end up in a place where they are mistreated and brutalized? And those are the questions you know, we, have to, we have to ask. How do we make sure that the places where people belong become habitable once again? Let me tell you, it's not by doing the way Europe is doing. Giving money to militias in Libya to put black people in camps and sell them on slave markets. That's what Europe is doing. Europe should take that money and give it fund efforts ongoing. Some of us are in, in, engaged in that, in opening Africa to herself, which means undertaking a major task of, if you want, deborderization and saddling the continent from the 50 and more colonial boundaries it inherited since 1884. There's a date for it. It was done in 1884. So one of the big utopias in the continent, when we say movement, mobility, that's what it's related to. It's also related to the kind of history we have been part of, which hasn't been always beneficial for us. It hasn't always treated us kindly. It hasn't. And uh, the instance where we find that unkind treatment by history has been around questions of mobility. How to move and shackle. Why is it that we always have to move in chains? And uh, you see, if that what it means to reanimate uh, the human, then I, I will sign up for that. Uh, but I, since I already told you that, I don't believe in, in the human. Uh, this is me with that. I will stop now. <laughs>